Why we love the Tang Dynasty Exploring the unique charm of what's seen by many as the greatest imperial dynasty in Chinese history. Episode 5 Love, Cherish, Honor and Obey In this episode, we're continuing our examination of the lives of women in the Tang Dynasty and focusing especially on the structure of marriage and divorce. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we'll be getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it was possibly the most powerful, interconnected, and innovative country in the world, with a rich and influential legacy that survives to this day. It's often said that if you want to understand the people of an era, then it's important to examine family life. And the cornerstone of that? Marriage. Now, we're going to do things a little back to front here, because some of the greatest sources of information on the role of women in Tang society are actually the divorce agreements and templates unearthed in Dunhuang in northwest China's Gansu province. It was found in what's known as the Library Cave at the Mogao Caves. Situated at a strategic point along the Silk Road, Mogao Caves stand at a crossroads of trade, religion and intellectual influences. 492 caves, famous for their statues and wall paintings spanning 1,000 years of Buddhist art. It's classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Among all the caves, the Library Cave, discovered in 1900, might be the most important one. It contained tens of thousands of manuscripts and relics, providing an amazing insight into the complex history of ancient China and Central Asia. One of the most fascinating artifacts discovered in this cave was the agreement on letting the wife go. The argument stated in the document goes roughly as follows. The reason why a man and a woman become husband and wife is because they had been attached to each other in an earlier life. If their marriage doesn't work out, they become antagonistic towards each other. Being of different minds, how can they tie the lover's knot? It's much better if they go back to their old lives. In these days of high-profile and bitter divorce battles, the process seems remarkable. But how common was it in the Tang Dynasty? Was this typical? Well, certainly divorce certificates from the Tang dynasty show that women in Tang enjoyed higher status and more respect within marriage than women in other dynasties. Although, let's not be hasty, the status a woman had within a marriage was still very much up to the whims of the husband. Such agreements were typically made up of three parts according to an official template. The first part urged the couple to cherish their marriage. The second explained what had gone wrong, although blame was never apportioned. And the third suggests that both sides should make a better match in the future. At the end, such documents would spell out what settlement was due. All this tended to be done within the families concerned, albeit with official paperwork, the template. Men, however, couldn't arbitrarily divorce their wives and it had to be done properly or dishonour could be brought on the family. Some divorce agreements specified that harassing the ex-wife after a divorce was forbidden, unless that was part of the agreement. Men were not allowed to stop outside their ex-wife's home, for example, or intimidate them by pulling faces or dwell on the past. But before you can get divorced, you clearly need to get married. Marriage was seen as important in Tang society, not just for the living, but for the dead too. Ancestors were often called upon in ceremonies to sanctify the union, to give their permission for accepting the new wife into the family. There were even cases of people being married after they were dead. While the Tang dynasty is often cited as a good place for women, a liberated place where some enjoyed high status and freedom, in general women were still seen as subservient. 
Marriages were usually arranged by the parents of a man and a woman using a matchmaker. The family of the man had more control in the process. A good marriage was less about love and more about what the couple could bring to the family in terms of wealth and status. The prospective bride and groom weren't allowed to meet before the wedding in case they got up to mischief, which was banned by the Tang legal code. There was a whole long list of things which were banned, such as marriage between close relatives, or marriages during a mourning period for a parent. Marriage across social classes was also frowned upon. A concubine should never be elevated to the status of a wife. A match between people with the same surname was also disapproved of. Empress Wu Zetian was especially hot on the rules, and once forced someone to divorce simply because they had the same surname. She also sought to limit the power of old established families by banning marriages between them and so forming powerful alliances. These old families, clans, wielded immense power. They even saw themselves as above the emperor. Marriages often took place between the families, but seldom outside. There's a saying that goes along the lines of the emperor's daughter need never worry about finding a husband. And that was because there was never a shortage of potential suitors. The big question was trying to find the right one. Princesses were useful tools in international politics. They would often be married off to the rulers of neighboring states. Sometimes it was an appeasement strategy. Okay, let's not fight. How about I give you a princess? Often they took on the status of an ambassador. Some records suggest that these marriage alliances, or her chin, happened 21 times during the Tang dynasty. The all-important Tang penal code makes the assumption that women are secondary to men. Women suffer lesser punishments for crimes, especially if their husband is concerned, because it's assumed they take their orders from their husbands. The code has much to say about marriages. It mentions seven virtues, which give us a pretty good idea of the role of women in society and marriage generally. The first feminine virtue was meekness and humility. A woman was expected to be meek and humble in front of her husband and male relatives, including her sons. Fathers were expected to teach girls the right way to behave through certain rituals. One such ritual would take place when a girl was just three years old. It involved putting the child under the bed alone with a spindle as a first toy. This was done to teach her about her inferior position in the household and the importance of hard work represented by the spindle. The second virtue was to respect one's husband and play a submissive role within the marriage. Likewise, men were taught to be good but commanding husbands. Basically, there was a hierarchy in the family, namely, the father is the god in the eyes of the son, and the husband is a god in the eyes of the wife. The third virtue states that a man should always be strong and the woman soft, and not the other way round. Although husbands were allowed by the code to beat and scold their wives in case of disrespectful behaviour or contempt towards the husband, such actions were seen as undermining the institution of marriage. To the fourth virtue, which speaks of women's behaviour within a marriage in terms of ethics, words, appearance and domestic work. The fifth feminine virtue called for women's devotion to be spouses until death. Men could remarry after the death of their wife, especially if it safeguarded the future of the family. The sixth feminine virtue called for a woman to bend her own will to accommodate the will of others, especially to win favour of her husband and parent-in-laws. 
Additionally, women were expected to show recognition of the Confucian family and social hierarchy as upheld by their husbands. The seventh and final feminine virtue emphasized the need to maintain cordial relations with her husband's siblings. She had to make sure that she was accepted and retained by her new family and keep impressing the in-laws. The code gives seven reasons a man could divorce his wife. Unfilialness to her parents-in-law, bearing no son, adultery, jealousy, malignant disease, talking too much, and stealing. It's clear that women in the Tang dynasty were weighed down by very high standards of moral and behavioral expectations, with some being impractical by today's standards. However, some still found the wherewithal to be poets, politicians, to dance, ride horses, and even play polo, it seems. Special thanks go out to San Lien Zhong Du for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time. Bye.